This week at Starbase, test article B18.1 undergoes several more rounds of testing before being joined by B18.3. Testing begins on the Deluge system for Pad 2, and Ship 38 is relocated to the launch site for static fire testing. Is SpaceX still on track for launching the 11th Starship flight test before the end of the year? Well, let's dig into this week's update and find out. This week at Starbase, test article B18.3 was rolled out of Mega Bay 1 and into the ring yard, clearing some space inside the bay. A new stainless steel subassembly was spotted during transport to the ring yard. A new assembly, an apparent new design of header or storage tank for Super Heavy Block 3, was brought into Mega Bay 1. Inside the bay, Booster 18's liquid oxygen tank section was lifted up and over the work stand with the new mystery tank for integration. Crews were also at work inside test article B18.3 as they continued to ready the subscale tank for proof testing. A ship lifter was brought to Mega Bay 2, which was soon hooked up to the overhead crane. Meanwhile, crews began working on the grid fin cutouts in B18.3 and continued to work on them the next day. A four-barrel ring section with a dome was brought out of Star Factory and sent over to Sanchez for scrapping. This segment seems to be a prototype of the Starship Block 3 aft end with several notable changes. The power head for the vacuum Raptor engines have been partially recessed into the lower liquid oxygen tank dome and the base of the dome has been flattened to raise the height of the sea level engines. This will make the skirt section shorter, decreasing the dry mass of the ship while increasing the length of the propellant tanks. Early on Friday morning, Booster 18's long-awaited aft section was rolled out of Star Factory, giving us the first look at the first part of the Block 3 Super Heavy. The partially assembled liquid oxygen header tank can be seen in the center, and outside of the tank, subsystems and plumbing lines can be seen wrapping around the bottom of the segment. After going through the ring yard, the tank was brought into Mega Bay 1 for final assembly. Moving over to the launch site to take a look at construction, the build-out of Pad 2's water deluge system continues, with crews adding two more water storage tanks for the water-cooled flame deflector and the launch table's upper deck. Meanwhile, the mega bunker at the launch complex's D2 gate continues to come together. Making use of an on-site 300-ton crane, precast concrete wall segments are being lifted into place, piecing together a protective shell for the launch site's most sensitive equipment. Concrete work is also underway at the air separation plant site. Crews are making good progress on the groundwork, with the foundations of protective concrete walls coming together. While old equipment was shipped out, new equipment was brought in. Two truckloads of vaporizer blowers were brought in to fit out the expanded tank farm, as well as five concrete rings for a pump station vault. Construction at Giga Base site continued with new concrete pours for one of the pile caps and groundwork for handling drainage. Amid the new construction, workers began testing Pad 2's major subsystems. The liquid oxygen booster quick disconnect mechanism was extended for the first time and put through a battery of seven extension and retraction tests. With a blast of displaced air that sent tents flying, the flame bucket deluge system at Pad 2 was activated for the first time. The flame deflector's high power deluge system is designed to protect the steel structure while it guides the exhaust from Super Heavy's Raptor 3 engines out and away from the rocket and launch pad infrastructure. Over at Pad 1, crews performed a set of fast retraction tests of the ship quick disconnect arm, checking its readiness ahead of Flight 11. Moving back over to the Massey outpost, test article B18.1 went through a battery of five cryo tests, cycling through several load, pressurization, depress, and detanking rounds throughout the week. On the fifth test of the week and its 11th test overall, the tank sprung a leak and began pushing out a cloud of cold nitrogen. With the launch and mount reconfiguration complete now, Starship 38 was loaded onto a transport stand and brought out of the launch site for its pre-static fire test at Pad 1. The following morning, the chopsticks lifted the ship before slewing over the launch table, and after a short wait to let the vibrations dampen out, the ship was lowered onto the ship's static fire adapter. The next morning, the launch mount work platform was lowered, clearing the way for Ship 38 to begin its final battery of readiness test, starting with the ship's forward and aft flaps. The chopsticks were then opened and raised into the ready position for a static fire. The detonation suppression system was also tested, ensuring it was ready to reduce the threat of volatile gas buildup under the vehicle. 
With the pad clear now, the Pad 2 Flame Diverter Deluge system was tested at high power for the first time. The flow of high pressure water was much stronger than the first test and water could be seen gushing out beneath the launch table. Back at Pad 1, the orbital launch mount began venting to chill the propellant lines for loading, but after an on-again, off-again round of venting, propellant loading was aborted and testing was done for the day. The road was soon reopened and the chopsticks were lowered back down and closed around Ship 38. A second attempt began on Friday morning, with the chopsticks moving back up to the ready position. The roadblock was reset and another detonation suppression system test was performed. After the pad was cleared, the Pad 2 Deluge system was tested for a third time, churning out a fine spray of water. A fourth test of Pad 2's Deluge system was the strongest yet, with the weir pipe vent pushing a stream of water nearly to the height of the launch tower. This may have been the first test with the ridge vent at the top of the diverter. Meanwhile, at Pad 1, the launch mount vents opened up, with cryo load starting on Ship 38 shortly afterward, gradually filling the ship's liquid oxygen tank. However, something went wrong during the process. The test was aborted and the ship was once again detanked. After unloading the propellants, the road was reopened and the chopsticks were lowered back down around the ship. The orbital launch mount work platform was brought back and raised under Ship 38 to work the problems behind the two aborted static fire tests. Shortly after midnight on Friday night, the B-18.3 test article was rolled out of the build site and began its journey to the Massey outpost. A little over two hours later, the Block 3 booster test article arrived at the site to begin qualification testing for this latest iteration of SpaceX's Super Heavy booster. In other space news, a judge ruled in favor of SpaceX this week in a lawsuit filed against them after Integrated Flight Test 1. The lawsuit, which asserted that the environmental impact statement was incorrect and needed to be redone, could have caused years of delays at Starbase. In a post on X, Elon Musk confirmed that SpaceX is getting a new marine asset for transporting ships and boosters from Starbase to the Cape. A breakover structure will be used to lay the ships and boosters horizontally for the trip. SpaceX also published an update this week detailing their efforts to qualify and evolve the future Starship operations at the Cape as a multi-user spaceport. Using data from subscale testing and full-scale data from the destruction of Ship 36, SpaceX has been given the go-ahead to use a very small exclusion corridor at LC-39A and LC-37 with a keep-out zone that's just under 1.3 miles wide. This will allow the other launch companies operating at the Cape to keep working even while Starship is flying. The FAA has published a draft environmental assessment for additional launch and landing corridors from Starbase. The two newly proposed flight paths cross over land, passing over Florida in the northern path and the Cayman Islands and Jamaica on the more southern route. A landing corridor is also shown for Starship, crossing over Mexico before coming into South Texas and landing back at the launch site. Moving on to Falcon 9 updates this week, we saw the launch of four Falcon 9 rockets, two from Cape Canaveral and two from Vandenberg. The Starlink Group 17-10 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg on Saturday. Using Falcon 9 Booster 1071, they successfully lofted 24 satellites into orbit. This milestone launch was the 300th Starlink mission launched by SpaceX. The CRS-NG-23 mission lifted off from SLC-40 at Cape Canaveral on Sunday. Booster 1094 carried Northrop Grumman's new Cygnus XL spacecraft into orbit and headed for the International Space Station. The spacecraft is named SS William Willie McCool after one of the astronauts who lost their lives in the Columbia disaster. Although the new Cygnus spacecraft is carrying 33% more cargo to the station than ever before, there was still enough margin for a Falcon 9 boost back and touchdown at landing zone 2. The next day, just read the instructions headed back out to sea ahead of the Starlink Group 10-61 mission. Falcon 9 Booster 1092 successfully lifted off from Slick 40 on Thursday, lofting 28 Starlink satellites into space. The fourth and final launch of the week was the Starlink Group 17-12 mission lifting off from Slick 4E in Vandenberg with another 24 Starlink satellites. Booster 1088 successfully landed downrange on Of Course I Still Love You, completing its 10th flight. 
In other space news, two more mount legs were lifted into place at LC-39A as SpaceX aims to bring the Starship pad into service in the coming months. During the NG-23 briefing, SpaceX revealed that the new landing zone at LC-40 will be operational early next year, replacing the current pads. United Launch Alliance has almost finished configuring their own launch pad for the Atlas V rocket, which will launch the next batch of Amazon Project Kuiper satellites on the 25th. PLD Space successfully performed a burst test of their Mira 5 launch vehicle's Stage 1 liquid oxygen tank. With the flood of cryogens, the tank was successfully qualified for flight. After some technical difficulties from a premature engine shutdown, the Cygnus XL spacecraft successfully arrived and docked at the ISS, beginning its multi-month stay at the orbital outpost. Welding work has been completed on Vast Space's Haven 1 flight article, completing the pressure vessel ahead of testing and integration. Stoke Space shared images of its own flame diverter this week, which will soon be undergoing deluge tests for the pad in support of their upcoming fully reusable Nova launch vehicle. Blue Origin announced that its second Blue Moon Mark I lander will carry the Viper rover to the moon in late 2027. The Viper, or Volatile's investigating polar exploration rover, which was canceled in 2024 over budget concerns and delays, will now have the chance to perform its mission to search for water ice on the lunar surface. NASA's Artemis II mission team has finished installing the four-panel Ojibe fairing for the Orion spacecraft's launch abort system. Artemis II is scheduled to launch early next year. And there you have it, another jam-packed space update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.